Hi Ninja Nerds, in this video today we're going to be learning about pressure injuries. So if you like this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up, comment down below, don't forget to check out ninjanerd.org. That's where for every lecture that Zach and I put up here on YouTube on Ninja Nerd and Ninja Nerd Nursing, we have notes and illustrations there for you guys to use and follow along with all of our lectures. But let's start talking about pressure injuries and how these occur within our patients. So when we have a patient who's immobile, usually, there's a, a force of pressure that is exerted within our skin, our integumentary system, has this capillary bed. If you remember all the way back from anatomy and physiology, we have all these different layers and we have perfusion to this area, to skin. And when we have a patient who's immobile for a long period of time for many different reasons, whether it's a neuro issue, whether they just don't know because they're confused, whether it's because they can't move on their own and they're immobile, we have a constant pressure with on our skin. And that constant pressure with on our skin can cause capillary compression and that capillary compression can cause ischemia to that area. So let's back it up a little bit and talk about what's going on here. We have our skin diagram here and we want to remember that we have areas like our epidermis, which is our top layer here. And then we have our dermis, where we have all of that nice perfusion with our capillaries. Then we have our hypodermis underneath. And then with underneath the hypodermis, we have our muscle and our bone. And it's very important, our skin is a very important organ that our body uses in order to keep things that are out of the body out and things to keep in the body in. So we're keeping our organs nice and warm, we're keeping them nice and protected. We also are keeping all of those things outside. But when our integumentary system or our skin has some type of opening that shouldn't be there, like a wound, it's going to allow something to enter that maybe shouldn't be within our skin and that we can have skin breakdown, we can have um, infection and so on and so forth. So remember, it's really important to keep our skin nice and healthy for as, as long and as um, prolonged as possible within our lifespan. And this diagram you're looking at here, you might be a little confused. And you just drew a diagram and now it looks like it's flipped upside down. I flipped this upside down because I want you to remember that our, our skin layers here, our epidermis, dermis, and hypodermis are very important. And the epidermis is the area that's going to interact with the outside world, right? So out here we have different things like pathogens, we have dirt, we have grime, we have bacteria, and all of those have the potential to enter in. And how does that occur again? How can we go from having a nice, healthy, uh, integumentary system in order to have thing, a wound develop. One of those ways is that constant pressure, right? So here is our di skin diagram flipped upside down, right? So this is our epidermis and this is the inside of our body. And what we have here is it's nice and healthy, it's getting perfused, it's, it has no wounds. But over here, our patient has been sitting maybe in a chair for a long period of time. So inside, the body we have here, our body or a bone that's pressing on the skin, right? It's got this pressure from sitting. And then the chair is our outside force pressing in on that skin. And when we have that compression there, we have compromised perfusion. And that compromised perfusion can eventually lead to our ischemia. Right? And when we have that ischemia, that's where we start having breakdown of our skin. So what is going on? Where are all these parts in our body, these bony prominences, they're called, that have that potential to have this breakdown? You may have seen some of them in lectures before. You may have um, seen them on clinical, but we have these bony prominences. And those are the areas, essentially, where the bone is maybe a little more superficial or exerts more pressure on our skin, like this diagram. And then we have an outside force, the chair, the bed, um, booties, our nasal cannula on our face and our ears, those can potentially cause breakdown as well. So I just drew a little diagram here for us to look through and just get an idea of what we're talking about with these bony prominences. So right here, we have a patient who's laying supine, right? They're in bed, they're facing up. And we can kind of identify and think through what's going on with this patient. Where are all these bony prominences or where are areas of potential breakdown within the skin? So if you're looking at this, you can already look right here at the occiput, right? The back of the head is going to be pressing on that pillow. And it, you just lay, if you're thinking about laying on a hard surface, for you, if you were to lay on a hard surface, think of all the areas of your body that would be coming in contact with that hard floor. So we have the back of the head, we have the back of the shoulder blade or the scapula, we have the elbows, right? We have the coccyx or sacral area, 
and we have the back of the heels. That's just one area, an example for this patient laying supine. If the patient was laying on their side, we can also think about things like their ear, their shoulder, right, their hip bone on the side. We can also think about their elbow as well and their wrist. And then also the knees here. The knees and the ankle are pretty important. Remember when you're laying on your side, a lot of people like to put a pillow or a wedge between their legs, and that has to do for two reasons. One, we have the bed pressing on this knee that is laying down against the bed, but then we also have the one knee touching the other knee, right? So now we have two bony prominences pressing on each other, and we have skin on skin. That also has a potential for breakdown. So that also has a potential for a wound to build up. So speaking of risks, what are some risk factors for a patient to potentially develop some type of pressure injury? Well, one of them is just, like I said in the beginning, is someone being immobile. If they aren't moving, then they are not going to be able to relieve that pressure. And that pressure, that constant um, compression with on the skin, and then because of that, they're gonna have that ischemia and that breakdown. So their immobility, and that immobility is a very wide range, right? I want you to think all the way from somebody who just doesn't want to get up, so they're going to have breakdown. Somebody who can't move freely, they can't adjust themselves, so they're not gonna be able to get up. And that's not just they can't because they're unable to, maybe they don't have the strength, but also think about what we're doing to our patients. Maybe we're giving them some pain medication to relax and they're sleeping a little deeper than normal so they're not rolling side to side. Maybe this patient's sedated because they have a tube and there's other things going on, so we also aren't gonna be moving around as, as often as we should. So whenever a patient is immobile for a prolonged period of time, puts them at risk for a pressure injury. Another one is going to be then that decrease in neuro, right, or sensation you wanna think, right? Something is going on to decrease their ability to sense that they are having pain or they're having some type of discomfort, right? And it could be, again, from us giving them medication, could be something else that is going on, a potential injury to the brain. What else is going on? Somebody who has aging skin or is older, Right, the skin is more fragile, so that also has potential to break down more often. We also have somebody who is affected by shear or friction. Well, what's that? Remember, when we talk about ergonomics in nursing school, and we're talking about moving our patients in the correct way to protect us, it's also us protecting our patients and moving them in the correct way. So shear and friction we're gonna talk about in a minute is when we have some type of movement that is causing a tear within the skin or um, on the inside or outside of the skin. And I'll talk about that more in depth in a moment. What is another risk factor for a patient? We talked about them being immobile and we talked about them having that pressure. But what if the patient is mobile but they have something that is just giving them constant pressure? So you wanna think of things like devices. All right, so maybe they have something that is with on their skin. Maybe they're having those EKG stickers that have been on a little too long, or they have a tube that was just laying in an area along their skin. Again, like the nasal cannula on the cheeks or on the back of the ear. Anything that is coming in contact with the skin, that can also cause a potential breakdown, okay? So now we've talked about all these different types of risk factors. We wanna start now thinking about that shear and friction. I talked about it for a second there. But shear and friction are these forces that can occur from us moving our patient or our patient involuntarily moving. So what do I mean by that? Well, we have a potential for shear, which is when the patient's essentially moving and something underneath them is not. Or we have friction, where we're trying to move one thing one way and one the other way. And these kind of coincide, and that's why people get really confused as to what was this a shear injury or was it a friction, friction injury? And they kind of can be very, very similar, synonymous, but they aren't the same. So it's very confusing for new nurses to understand what's the difference between shear and friction. So the way I remember it is that shear is essentially the tear with inside, right, on that skin. So there's a, there's a damage within that capillary bed in the skin, and then that decreased perfusion causes that potential breakdown within skin. Where friction is more of an external um, affection, right? We have friction when you rub your hands together, you can create your own friction. So that's more superficial, not starting within, but starting kind of right on the top. Both of them can cause a potential for that skin breakdown. So one of the most common frictions that a patient can come across, or a shear injury that a uh, nurse can come across, is when the patient moves. So if we're going to adjust our patient in bed and we're trying to move them maybe by herself or the patient is a little bigger and we're having trouble lifting them, moving them and causing that shear or that drag across the mattress, right? 
that can cause skin breakdown. Another one that they always like to sneakily put into the NCLEX or onto your nursing exams is if a patient is sitting in a bed that's been raised up. So the head of bed here is greater than 30 degrees. And because of that, this patient has a potential to sit a little higher in the bed. And over time, for two, three hours, as they are sliding down, right, their sacrum starts to slide. And because of that, that can cause breakdown right here, right, in that bony prominence in the skin. So when we think about shear and friction, we want to think about all the potential ways we can protect our patients. One of them is to put that draw sheet on the bed so we're able to move them or using a cloth chucks or a pad underneath them rather than those plastic ones that rip. That's going to allow us to hopefully adjust our patient in bed a lot safer. And then using another friend, right? Using a fellow um, nurse or tech to help you move that patient up in bed. So what are some signs and symptoms or what are some things that we need to look out for for a patient that could potentially develop um, a pressure injury or somebody who has and we're looking at things that we're like, uh-oh, something's going on. One of those things is the Braden scale. If you don't know what the Braden scale is, don't worry. I'm going to have a video on it separately in a little bit. But the Braden scale is essentially a scale that you can use whenever you do assessment on your patient. Your skin assessment is going to include the Braden scale along with the patient's mobility and neuro status in order to develop a score. And that score is going to tell you if they have a potential for breakdown. So the Braden scale is a very good indicator or a sign that maybe this patient is at risk higher than other patients for skin breakdown. So using the Braden scale is a very important thing that we can do. But we also want to look at the, the signs and symptoms of is, is the skin looking healthy, right? Is it looking a uh, normal color? Is it healthy and pink? It looks like it's perfusing, it's blanchable. Because if it's not blanchable, that's where we start going into our stages. Right, our stages of our wounds and our press pressure injuries. So is it blanchable? Is the patient able to tell us that something is not right? It, are they able to say, oh, I don't know, this feels uncomfortable, this is hurting me? Is the patient just itching or giving you clues non-verbally, right? You're sitting there looking at them and they're, they keep itching at one side. Um, and that itching is causing a minor breakdown and then they lay on that side for two hours. So another sign or symptom that maybe something else is going on. And you also gotta start thinking about, we talked about the neuro and then them not being able to tell you what's hurting. But another sign or symptom that a patient is at risk for potential breakdown is continence, right? Incontinence. If our patient is frequently wetting the bed or defecating in the bed, then they're gonna have a potential for breakdown as well because that is very uh, corrosive to the skin. Sitting in your own urine or feces for a long time can affect the skin as well. So the signs and symptoms of pressure injuries are gonna go into eventually our wound staging, which we'll talk about in a separate video because it can get a little confusing. But I want you to just think of it as a whole. A very, very um, substantial sign of skin breakdown is just them being at risk for it, right? Having diabetes or being obese or being immobile or being on sedation are just those key signs that we're thinking, okay, our patient might be at a risk for a breakdown. So let's go into now the nursing interventions as to how we can prevent these pressure injuries from developing. Now we're at the part where we have a patient where we think is potentially at risk for a pressure injury or already has a pressure injury. So let's talk through how we're going to protect this patient from either not getting an injury or their injury not getting any worse. So the first thing we're going to do with our nursing intervention is we're going to assess the skin. And I say that because it's sometimes not as obvious as people do. Um, they always go straight for cardiovascular and the neuro and those are great too, but skin is really important as well. So when we're assessing the skin, a lot of things that we want to keep in um, thoughts is what we talked about with those risks, right? Are they immobile? Are they neuro um, capable? Are they able to tell me what's going on that they have to go to the bathroom? So when we assess the skin, a really good thing to do, and a lot of places now do a two nurse assessment, right? So you do a team assessment of the skin. Uh, and that does a couple different things. One, it helps two sets of eyes looking at the patient. It also helps you, you know, talk through and assess things together. Does this look like a stage one? Does this look like a stage two, stage three to you? And then when we do it, it's also the ability to assess the patient comfortably, right? We'll be at, one person will be able to hold and roll the patient while the other one can look at the back of the patient and things like that. So assessing 
with two nurses just gives you those extra eyes and extra hands to assess your patient properly. When we do assess, we are going to document, right? So when we're assessing the skin, we're gonna document. And what we need to do is um, document everything that we find. And if we do find something, we have to put that down. So what we're gonna be looking at is the area or the site, right? So you wanna put where, if you find an injury, it is. You wanna put the color. You wanna put if there's any drainage, right? If you can stage it, put the stage. You also wanna put the size. And then what you can also do is make sure you have your Braden scale number for that patient. You wanna make sure that you're able to put a number to them because that's going to assess the patient's right now risk for a pressure injury. And we can see how that changes during their admission. Is the patient's number going up? Is it going down? And that way we can make sure we're protecting our patient throughout um, their stay, but also throughout our shift. So every shift, you should be putting in a Braden scale. If you do find a wound, one of the things you can do is collect that drainage through a swab and then send it off for a culture, right? And what does that have to do with anything? That is telling us that, you know, if we're sending this swab off, does this patient have MRSA? Does this patient have some other type of bacteria? That way we can correctly um, treat this patient's wound as well as make sure we are treating them as a whole, right? We're not only just looking at the wound, but is there something else going on within this patient? They have this breakdown because of some secondary thing as well going on. So we talked about some of those nursing interventions before, but let's go over them again. We have a patient laying here in that bony prominence in a supine area. So things that we can do for them immediately is if they're pretty immobile, we can put that draw sheet here underneath. And if you've never seen that before, that is something you can use when you have your second friend here to move the patient. You can both grab onto the draw sheet and be able to lift the patient up and up into the bed rather than dragging them up into the bed. There's also devices that we can use for them. So if their heels are at risk for tear, we can put booties on their feet. We also can do things like a special mattress. This could be a waffle mattress or an air mattress that has the ability to shift the weight. And what I mean by that is they have air pockets that will um, inflate and deflate and allows the patient to just kind of like rock back and forth, giving them a little extra more movement off those compression points. For this patient too, remember, one of the big things the NCLEX likes to hit on is if your patient's immobile and they're laying on their side, what is something you're gonna do for them that's very easy to prevent pressure injuries? Relieve them from that pressure, right? So we can do the Q2 hour or more frequent turns, right? Making sure that we are moving them every two hours at minimum, right? You can move them every hour if you want. We also wanna make sure we are protecting the skin. Remember, the skin is keeping everything that's in it, inside of it, and trying to keep everything that should be out, outside of it. So we can use things like creams, right, which will help with a barrier, or gels. We can also start using things like certain types of pillows, wedges. We can also look into certain types of pads or anything else that we can put in places. So think about the back of the ears for the nasal cannula. They can have those little ear pads when they have the nasal cannula. We can also look into a consult, right? Particularly to who? We wanna think about wound care, right? So this consult will then get our wound care team onto this patient's care as well. And then they can also come and check it out. And then they'll be able to document as well as give us other types of bandages and barrier creams and things like that that we can put on this patient as well to help them get better. We also want to start talking about another consult, which is nutrition, right? If this patient is at risk or does have a pretty substantial wound, we can talk to nutrition about that. And nutrition is really important in wound healing because protein is a very good thing to have in our diet in order to promote our wound healing. So we want to think about everything that we can give them that's protein-based along with other things that are healthy for them to 
heal as well. So you think about strawberries and broccoli as well, and then hit those proteins with our meats, like our chicken and our, our red meats, depending on the patient, their diet, and all their comorbidities. But this is a really important thing to get on board as well, is to talk to the patient about their nutrition, because that's going to also help promote that wound healing. All right, Ninja Nerds, so in this video, we talked about pressure injuries and how we can prevent them. Make sure you also check out the Braden scale and the wound staging video as well in order to understand this concept as a whole. But I hope you like this video, and as always, until next time.